Good morning. My name is Gloria and I'm from uh, Nature Society. I'm the vice chairperson of the education committee. So thank you for coming uh, early in this morning and uh, to listen to the talk on migratory birds on the Malay Peninsula by Dr. Yong Ding Li. So this webinar is the second that Ding Li and I have planned together. The first being uh, one by Rob Stubing on the Mansangat wetlands. So we have actually decided to make it a series and call it the Wild World series, okay? Because um, essentially we want it, it to be, uh, to roll out more of such webinars focusing on the work of conservationists in this region. So if you have any questions uh, anytime in the talk, please type it out in the chat box and we'll take questions later. Okay, so just to give you an introduction, if you don't know who is Ding Li, he is the BirdLife International's Program Manager for the Flyways Program in Asia. He currently oversees work from Myanmar to Russia, and uh, he's also a long-time Nature Society member and has worked closely with the Nature Society Bird Group since 2001. Okay, so without further ado, we can have Ding Li uh, tell us more about migratory birds. Ding Li. Hi. Thanks, thanks, Gloria, for uh, hosting me uh, on a, on a gloomy Saturday morning to talk about migratory birds. <laughs> yeah, my uh, pleasure. And also at a time of the year where there there ain't no migratory birds in the country. Well, oh, yeah. not not that's that good. many. Yeah, there's quite a few, but not as many as they would usually be. Okay. Um, I'm just going to uh, first sort out my PowerPoint. So let me do a quick share screen. Okay. Gloria, is it visible on your side, the screen? Uh, yeah, it's starting to appear. Yes, it's okay. visible now. Yeah. Okay, all good. Okay, so over to you. I'll mute myself now. Can do. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Ding Li, uh, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about migratory birds because they are a, a group of birds that I work on and also a group of birds that I am uh, deeply interested in, uh, in, in saving because they are such an incredible uh, bunch of species um, and I have to spend a couple of uh, well I wish I could sp speak on on this topic for an hour or more uh, but we don't have that much time so I will uh, give you a, a quick bit of introduction about migratory birds um, in the Malay Peninsula so I will not just be covering them for Singapore I'll also be talking about migratory birds in Peninsula Malaysia uh, as well as Peninsula Thailand, which all forms uh, a part of the Malay Peninsula. Um, and I hope to end off my session today by sharing with you a little bit about the kinds of work that we do to protect migratory birds. Uh, also, you know, to give you uh, all an idea of where you should be visiting. I, I know it's difficult for you to travel right now, but uh, when times are better, um, there are quite a few really cool places for you to see migratory birds on the peninsula so i'll introduce a bit of those places and uh, hopefully one day we can get to visit them so um here here we are uh, on the malay peninsula um singapore is right at the tip of the malay peninsula and essentially is a is a is a part of the malay peninsula but i think before i get into the uh, nitty gritties of migratory birds i just wanted to make sure we know where our geographical uh senses are uh, the Malay Peninsula is obviously a very um, unusual piece of land sticking out of the Asian continent. Uh, for those of you who, like uh, like me who look a lot at maps, it's quite interesting because uh, the peninsula itself spans more than 1,500 kilometers out of um, Southeast Asian mainland. Um, and you can see on my map here, you know, um, it, it, it covers... Uh, quite a diverse amount of habitat. You can see that there are some areas which are really dark green, which are obviously areas that are still in good forest cover. You can see quite a bit of the Thai Peninsula being in dark green. Strips of dark green in the uh, the southern part of the Thai Peninsula, which shows us that there isn't that much forest left. And uh, coming down to Peninsula Malaysia, that you can still see quite large chunks of, uh, you know, stripes of green. These are the major mountain ranges. The Malay Peninsula is a very interesting piece of landmass. It's surrounded uh, by the South China Sea on the east side. You can see here, it's a, obviously a, quite a shallow sea because you see the blue here is pretty light colored compared to the darker blue further up here. Um, and then the Andaman Sea to the left, to the, to the west of the peninsula. Um, between the peninsula and another very major landmass for biodiversity is the Malacca Strait. So the Malacca Straits uh, basically cut the Malay Peninsula away from Sumatra. It's very shallow, very uh, muddy at very many parts. If you look at the 
the map I have here, you can see that there are quite a bit of shades of gray here showing that there's lots of sediments coming down from the rivers, uh, not just from the peninsula itself, but also from Sumatra. And then right at the tip of the peninsula where my arrow is, that is where Singapore is um, and a bunch of satellite islands um, surrounded by the Real Archipelago of uh, Indonesia. So uh, very important landmass for biodiversity conservation. For those of you who are familiar with wildlife conservation or have traveled widely in the region, you know that there's uh, you know, so many different species of plants and animals on the Malay Peninsula, some really interesting species. Um, I, unfortunately, we won't have time to talk a lot about that because um, our focus today will mainly be on the migratory stuff. Um, but before we go deeper into the Malay Peninsula, I think it's good for us to understand uh, this thing called the East Asian Australasian Flyway, which is uh, a very, very important concept or a topic, You, I, if I may. It's, a, it's really a, a geographical part of Asia, which um, connects uh, different ecosystems across Northern Asia, Southeast Asia and Australasia by the migratory routes of different birds. So we can think of the East Asia Australasian flyway as a, as, as a gigantic um, highway or expressway for birds. If you look at the map that I have here on the, on the, on the right, you can see all these little lines, which basically shows you uh, the rough routes that migratory birds are taking when they move down and up and down and up the East Asian Australasian flyway. Essentially, it's the largest migratory bird corridor on the planet. You can see that this flyway covers um, a large chunk of uh, Eastern uh, Asia from much of Russia, all the way to the land masses uh, east of the giant Tibetan plateau. Uh, this is also one of the most crowded part of the world. I think that's not so surprising. If you look at the map, you see where all the countries with huge human populations are. You've got China here, you've got Korea, you've got Japan here. And all these three countries already add up to a, a billion people here. And then you've got another 600 million people living in, in Southeast Asia. Um, a lot of conservationists will also tell you, um, which I, we all fully agree with, that this is one of the most threatened um, you know, uh, regions for migratory birds around the world mainly because uh, there are so many people, there's a lot of competition between human beings and wildlife you know, for land. And I don't think it will surprise you that uh, there are more species that are threatened, more migratory species that are threatened than any other migratory uh, flyways in the, in the world. Um, there are seven other migratory flyways, depending on how you define them. Um, and this one is considered by uh, almost all conservationists to be the most threatened of them. Um, Southeast Asia, as you can see, you know, sits somewhere in the middle of the East Asian Australasian flyway it, and is uh, obviously a very important uh, part of this flyway uh, because a lot of birds, when they migrate south or when they migrate north, they will have to pass through, through uh, Southeast Asia. How many migratory bird species are there in Southeast Asia? Now, to put things into perspective, um, I'm not sure if many of us have actually tried to count the number of migratory species uh, in Southeast Asia or even the flyway as a whole. Uh, I tried to do that for a number of studies that I've done in the past. And uh, if you look at the East Asian Australasian flyway as a whole, there are more than 600 kinds of migratory birds. Uh, of which, uh, of which 500 plus plus species are actually moving you know, south every time uh, in the northern winter. So the vast majority of the migratory birds that we have here in, in, in Eastern Asia, they move south during the northern winter and they move back north to wherever they breed in Southeast Asia, northern parts of Southeast Asia, Siberia and China. But there's also a bunch of really interesting migratory birds in the flyway. In this flyway that we don't tend to think a lot about, these are the migrants that come from Australia and New Zealand. So it's still part of the same East Asian Australasian flyway, but these birds, they respond to the southern winter or the austral winter, we call it. 
So when winter strikes Australia and New Zealand, these species of birds will move north uh, towards Southeast Asia. Some of them might even move a little bit beyond Southeast Asia. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this phenomenon of birds coming in from Australia, but one of the best examples uh, we have here in this region is this bird called the Horsefields Bronze Cuckoo. Uh, the Horsefields Bronze Cuckoo is a bird that is only breeding in Australia, but uh, every time towards the middle of the year when Australia has its winter, these birds will come towards Southeast Asia. And this is probably a good time to see it. If you visit coastal areas, do keep a lookout for that bird, yeah. What are the kinds of migratory birds that we have in Southeast Asia? Well, there's quite a huge diversity. Um, altogether, we have more than 400 kinds of migratory birds coming to Southeast Asia. The majority of these uh, migratory birds are water birds, so birds that are associated with lakes, rivers, coastal wetlands and all that. But we also cannot forget that quite a lot of these migratory birds are passerine birds, songbirds, so to speak, you know. So you think of things like warblers, flycatchers, robins, thrushes, and all of that, yeah. And then, of course, there's also a very significant, significant group that are birds of prey, um, birds of prey, hawks, eagles, and all that. Uh, we do get quite a lot of different types of migratory birds of prey here on the uh, Malay Peninsula and in Southeast Asia. Um, <sighs> Studies that have been done you know, over the last 50, 60 years obviously show us that Southeast Asia is a very important part of, uh, of the world for migratory birds. Um, and I show you here a real uh, snapshot of the different kinds of studies that have been done. Um, we try to compile all the different kinds of studies about migratory birds where they were tracked by satellite. You know, So a lot of scientists who study migratory birds, they put little bits of uh, transmitters on the bodies of migratory birds. And these transmitters help us to collect information, to collect data that tells us exactly how migratory birds move. So on the, on the left panel, you know, uh, the left panel captures migratory birds that are raptorial birds of prey, so, so to speak. Um, and also a bunch of other non-passerines that have been studied. Um, the names are all given here. Each color corresponds to one particular species um, and one individual that has been tracked. And you can see that, uh, you know, there are not so many species that have been studied really. You know, if you put that in the context of what I've just mentioned, I mentioned that there were more than 400 species, you know, but, but of the species that have been really studied in detail is probably less than 50. So lots of migratory birds are not really uh, well known or well studied by ecologists. So um, if you look at the colors, a lot of these colors or colored lines that crisscross Southeast Asia, showing that a lot of migratory species pass through this region. Um, the orange line is the one that I like to draw your uh, attention to. Uh, you see this orange line that connects Japan here. This is Japan to Southeast Asia. And then the line follows the Malay Peninsula all the way down south to Indonesia. So this line here, for example, uh, is basically representing the migratory route of the oriental honey buzzard, a bird that most of the audience here is uh, well uh, versed with. Um, and one of the best studied um, species, migratory species here in Eastern Asia. Yeah, if you look on the, on the right panel, on the right panel, the right panel illustrates some of the, um, some of the passerine birds that have been studied by scientists in this part of the world. There are more studies going on. Um, some of that will be published this year by some of my colleagues. Uh, but as you can see, there are not so many studies of birds, um, passerine birds in Southeast Asia. Uh, but pretty much every passerine bird that have been studied by uh, my colleagues in Siberia, in Japan, uh, most of these passerine birds come to winter in Southeast Asia. So going back to my previous slide, you can see here that uh, Southeast Asia as a whole um, is a really important part of Asia for migratory species. Um, again, um, you can have a, have a closer scrutiny at the kinds of birds that has been studied by researchers. There are not that many. Some of these are probably very familiar species to you. Uh, some of you might even be surprised that a bird like the black nape oreo, a bird that you can see very commonly in Peninsula Malaysia and in Singapore, you know, to be migratory. 
Uh, indeed, some of them are migratory, and black black orioles they breed widely across Eastern Asia. Some of those that we see here in Singapore or in Malaysia are actually migrants from Eastern Asia. So, uh, lots we need to learn about migratory birds in this part of the world. Um, the peninsula, okay, I've gone through quite a bit about Southeast Asia without seeing a lot about um, the Malay Peninsula. Where is the peninsula in relation to Southeast Asia? Um, where does it fit into the bigger picture of migratory bird movements? Uh, the peninsula, as you can see, sits right in the middle here, right of the map here, right in the middle of the map. And obviously, it's not so far from the center point of the East Asian Australasian Flyway. So lots of migratory species need to pass through this region on their migrations. Uh, but that said, a lot of species also use this region as a place where they will spend the winter, you know, during the time of the northern winter, for example. And I give you here three quick examples um, of uh, migratory birds that you probably are aware of that comes to this part of uh, this part of Southeast Asia here in the Malay Peninsula. You've got the oriental honey buzzard, which I briefly mentioned earlier on. You've got a less familiar migratory bird called the, the Nordman's or spotted green shank, um, which is a, a, a bird that comes in good numbers to the Malay Peninsula in winter every year. They spend the winter here on the Malay Peninsula. And you've got here a flock of Pacific golden plovers. Pacific golden plovers are familiar species for bird watchers in Singapore and Malaysia and in Thailand because um, they are often seen here in good numbers every year, even though the numbers have declined. So the Malay Peninsula has a special place in the East Asian Australasian flyway by virtue of its location yeah, and uh, also by virtue of its geography. The way this piece of land pokes into Southeast Asia means that it is uh, obviously a very important corridor uh, for migratory birds along the East Asian Australasian flyway. A lot of things will pass through the peninsula, uh, but as as much as they will pass through the peninsula, there are also quite a lot of birds that would actually spend their yeah, winter here in the peninsula. Amongst the migratory birds that we know very well, um, I, I guess the best known groups are the water birds, right? Water birds are some of the most obvious, most easily observed groups of uh, uh, migratory birds. And many of us probably started off by noticing migratory birds because we saw water birds at some reserve that we have visited here in Singapore or in Malaysia. Um, Sungai Buloh is probably a, a, a popular place visited for many bird watchers in Singapore to look at migratory birds. Um, recently, more and more people are also going to places like Pulau Ubin, which is the turning up quite a good numbers of shorebirds. Uh, and over in Malaysia, in Malaysia, there are some really fantastic sites for, for waterbirds that uh, people go to. Um, there are lots of great areas of wetlands on the western coast of peninsular Malaysia. Uh, waterbirds, as I've said, is a, a, a good introduction to migratory birds because they are so visible and so easy to see. Um, and I'd like to quickly run through some of these uh, important places we know uh, where water birds use in good numbers in Malaysia and in Singapore. Um, I'm just going to jump slide a little bit. Um, if you look at the map of Peninsula of Malaysia, there are quite a, a concentration of these important sites for water birds on the western coast. And I think that's not surprising because the western coast borders the, the Malacca Straits. The Malacca Straits is a really um, enclosed area of sea. Uh, obviously, there will be large areas of tidal flats. Tidal flats are very important areas for many species of migratory birds, especially our shorebirds, all your sandpipers, plovers, and all that. And also a lot of tern species, they also use tidal flats for resting and for, um, you know, feeding on, uh, you know, fish and other uh, uh, marine organisms in coastal waters. Uh, on on the Malay Peninsula and especially here in Peninsula Malaysia, um, some of the most important sites for for shorebirds are in the northern and the central parts of the peninsula. You can see that uh, Penang Penang is very important for migratory waterbirds in the peninsula. Uh, for those of you who have the have the luck the fortune to be in Penang, uh, especially if you visit the, the, the mainland coast of Penang, they are some of the largest, most extensive areas of mud flats uh, and mangroves. Where each year, from the months of uh, from the months of late July onwards, you can start to see migratory birds um, like shorebirds and terns. Um, the other two really really important sites for migratory waterbirds in 
Peninsula Malaysia are in the state of Perak. Uh, some of you may have had the opportunity to visit Kuala Gula in Perak, which is a place where you could see not just uh, mangrove birds. A lot of people visit this part of Malaysia to see mangrove species, but there's also some really large areas of mud flats where you can see lots of shorebirds. And closer to the Malaysian capital of Kuala Lumpur, um, there are some of the most extensive areas of uh, mud flats here, you know, on the coast of the state of Selangor. Uh, so, well, for, for the convenience of bird watchers or researchers living in and around Kuala Lumpur, you can really get to some of these sites fairly easily. Um, and one of the best uh, and most important sites for, for migratory water birds in Malaysia can be found here around Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the, Kapa Power Station Ash Ponds. Uh, it's a really um, unusual site for water birds because this is a power station essentially. And the power station has carved out, you know, some uh, areas where they dumped the uh, ashes from burning coal. Um, but a lot of these migratory birds have found the ash ponds to be a really good place to roost in. And if you get to these ash ponds at the right time of the day when the tide is uh, going up, large groups of migratory shorebirds will be found there, including two of the more special species, the, the Great Knot and the Knotman's Green Shank. But in recent times, you know, surveys by a lot of our colleagues, our bird watching colleagues in Malaysia have also discovered uh, areas of where, where shorebirds are using that we did not know so much about until very recent times. So for example, in the, in the last couple of years, uh, there's been lots of surveys conducted on the coastline uh, leading out from Kuala Lumpur towards the northern part of Selangor. Uh, there are places like Jaram and Pantai Remis, which are uh, obviously turning out to be quite important for lots of migratory birds, uh, especially the threatened uh, Great Knot. Uh, closer to the southern part of the Malay Peninsula, you've got some really cool sites for shorebirds and for people who are living in Singapore, you can get to these sites. Not so, um, you know, not so difficult for you to get to these sites because they are just within one to two hours drive from Singapore. They are good sites for shorebirds on both the east coast and the west coast of Johor. A lot of bird watchers would have probably visited sites on the east coast of Johor, uh, like uh, places like... Uh, uh, Mersing. If you go to Mersing, there are always good numbers of shorebirds in Mersing. But if you go to the west coast of Johor, which is on the Malacca Straits, there are some pockets of uh, shorebird concentration in places like Mua, in Batu Pahat, and in, in Benut. So lots of really uh, important wetlands here, you know, on peninsular Malaysia for migratory waterbirds, terns, shorebirds, and all that. And I believe that in the years to come, we will find more such sites um, um, here on the peninsula. But in Singapore, if we go right to the tip of the Malay Peninsula, there are still some more sites for migratory shorebirds. Uh, not so much because Singapore's area is quite limited, uh, but there are five, uh, five major areas of coastal wetlands and bird, that bird watchers here tend to visit to see shorebirds. You've got the very uh, popular Sungai Buloh Wetland Reserve here, which sees uh, numbers in excess of 1-2,000 to shorebirds each year. Um, and not so far away from Sungai Buloh is another area of mangrove and mudflats uh, near to the, uh, the the causeway that links Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, there is the Mandai Mud Flats where a lot of the shorebirds that are actually in Sungai Buloh, they also make use of the Mandai Mud Flats. But if you move towards the eastern part of Singapore, there are quite another bunch of sites that are interesting for shorebirds. Uh, I've highlighted three of the, of the most frequently visited ones in recent times. Uh, a lot of bird watchers these days will go to the eastern tip, um, eastern tip of Pulau Ubin. Uh, for those of you who get to the eastern tip of Pulau Ubin, you'll find yourself surrounded by quite a large expanse of sandy flats um, and uh, seagrass beds. And every time the tide drops, quite a large congregation of, uh, you know, various kinds of plovers, sandpipers will gather here. I think in recent years, there have been flocks exceeding a thousand birds. So showing that Pulau Ubin is also quite an important part of Singapore for, uh, for migratory birds here. Closer to the center part of the island, you've got two sites, uh, one on the, uh, on the estuary of the uh, Salita River. Salita River is now basically a reservoir, but if you go to right on the mouth of the Salita uh, River, where the, the dam sits right now, you might see small numbers of migratory shorebirds. 
And uh, going to the southern part of Singapore, right near, not actually not very far from the city, there's one area um, on the Marine Marina Barrage Reservoir, where for those of you who have been lucky to visit, you will see quite good numbers of uh, shorebirds, um, especially plovers. So lots of cool places uh, for migratory waterbirds in Malaysia and in Singapore. Uh, what are the key species of migratory waterbirds that come to Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, in the peninsula? There are four that I can think of right now, but I'm sure there'll be more. It's four key threatened uh, migratory waterbird species. Uh, you've got the great knot, the, which is endangered, comes to the Malay Peninsula in pretty good numbers. If you go to places like uh, the coast of Selangor, the coast of Penang, and various parts of Peninsula, Thailand, you could still see great numbers of these uh, knots, you know, sometimes 100 to uh, more than 1,000 individual. The great knot is a species that's declining pretty fast uh, because it's lost quite a lot of its um, staging habitat in the eastern part of Asia, especially around the coast of Korea. Um, then you've got this really peculiar looking shorebird. It looks like it's always smiling because the way the beak is shaped is the Notman's Green Shang. The Notman's Green Shang is one of the rarest shorebirds in the world. You know, I don't think we've got more than 1,500 individuals left in a while. Um, and quite a good uh, chunk of the population of the Notman's Green Shang come down here to Southeast Asia to winter, especially on the, on the, on the Malay Peninsula coast. You can see them in good numbers in Penang, sometimes even in Selangor. Um, but uh, if you go further south of Selangor, you'll be lucky to see one or two birds. Um, sometimes you get one or two birds that slip over the border into Singapore, uh, but this is generally a rare bird. Um, consider yourself lucky if you could even see one or two of them. You've got the Chinese egret, uh, quite uh, a, a reasonable population of them winter here on the peninsula, although not as many as we would get in, in Borneo or in the Philippines, uh, but it's a really striking bird um, that some of you would you know see every now and then on the coast of Johor, on the co northeast coast of Singapore and the coast of uh, Selangor and Penang. Um, and of course here, we have another bird, a migratory water bird that is not a shore bird, you know, not a, a, a conspicuous bird running around on the mud flat, the mast fin foot. The mast fin foot is one of the least known birds in Asia. Um, there's not a lot of them left in the world. Um, and we know that the mass fin food come to the Malay Peninsula in numbers uh, back in the old days, but nowadays they are really, really rare. We haven't had a record of one for more than five years now. We are not sure where the mass fin foods that show up in Peninsula Malaysia and Singapore or Peninsula Thailand come from. Um, but we know that they breed mostly in the mainland part of Southeast Asia and they, they move south uh, towards the dry season of Southeast Asia. So the mass fin food is one of the migratory bird species that we are, you know, watching a little, a little bit more for because its numbers have declined quite substantially. I don't think we've seen any mass wind foods on the peninsula since 2015. Um, what about migratory land birds? I've talked a lot about migratory water birds, right? I've gone to egrets, I've gone through the fin foods as you have seen just now, and of course the sandpipers. What about land birds? Land birds are basically this whole group of migratory birds that include all your raptors, the birds of prey, the robins, the warblers, and all that. You know, where do these migratory land birds go to go through, and where do they use in winter? Uh, recently, a few of my colleagues and I, we did a little bit of a study of the key habitats for migratory land birds in the whole of Southeast Asia. And we find that uh, obviously, and not surprisingly, most of the migratory land birds that we get here in Southeast Asia are actually forest dependent. So if you look at this little chart that I've made here, yeah. uh, you see that for tropical forests, the, the, the bars are the highest. So that shows you that uh, the, the majority of the migratory land birds that come to countries from Bhutan to Vietnam, they use tropical forests. And that also shows that, you know, tropical forests as they are, uh, you know, being uh, lost so quickly across this region, a lot of migratory land birds are probably threatened by habitat loss, even though we don't know uh, much about declines of these species yet. So um, five key habitats for migratory land birds, you know, ranging from dry forests where you get in places like Thailand and Cambodia uh, to farmland, paddy fields. Paddy fields are the most uh, abundant kinds of farmland in, in Southeast Asia. They're also used by quite a good number of species of migratory land birds. But the most important of them all, obviously, are tropical forests, like what we have here in Singapore, uh, Peninsula, Malaysia, and Thailand. 
I'm not sure how many of you are, uh, you know, uh, very aware of what researchers have done to study migratory birds in the in the last 50 to 60 years, but you'll be surprised to find that one of the places that bird watchers love to go a lot to uh, to to watch birds in general is was one of the most important places where migratory birds were studied. He, uh, in the Malay Peninsula. And that place is none other than Fraser's Hill. Uh, Fraser's Hill is uh, right towards the center part of Malaysia's main range or the Titi Wangsa range. Um, and for those of you who were around in the 60s, you might be aware that there was a series of really um, very insightful studies led by the renowned ornithologist David Wells. David Wells and a lot of his colleagues, they spent uh, days trying to to, to capture migratory birds using mist nets uh, on a ridge line in Fraser's Hill and using light to attract these migratory birds. Um, and on some nights, they could be catching hundreds of migratory birds where they put little rings on their legs to, to, to eventually hope to find them back and get a sense of where they're moving between. So Fraser's Hill, a very important study site for migratory birds. Even though nowadays we hardly ever go to this part of Malaysia to see migratory birds, but historically it's been very important. And I wouldn't be surprised that uh, the things that were observed by David Wells and his colleagues back in the days are still passing through this um, important part of Malaysia's main range. For you who want, for those of you who want to, you know, find out a little bit more about the migration of uh, various birds of prey or passerine birds through Fraser's Hill, you've got to look out for this fantastic uh, book called Migration and Survival of the Birds of Asia. It's not an easy book to find, um, but it tells and it keeps all that data that's been collected by people working in Fraser's Hill uh, those days. Um, so I hope by now I've given you a fairly uh, good introduction to the birds of the Malay Peninsula, the migratory birds of the Malay Peninsula. But at this point, uh, we are also beginning to find out how little we know. You know, Like I say uh, in my previous slide on Fraser's Hill, that study was done more than 50 years ago. There hasn't been that many studies on migratory birds in the Malay Peninsula. And lots of what we uh, should know about the ecology of various kinds of shorebirds, passerines remains to be learned by scientists and bird watchers. One of the key examples that shows how little we know about the migratory birds here on the Malay Peninsula is that we are still not very sure where many of these populations of migratory birds come from. Uh, just a few months ago, a very important study was published by a colleague of ours, David Lee, uh, who works for the National Parks Board in Singapore. And he studied the migrations you know, of uh, some very familiar species of shorebirds to many of us, the Wimbro. Uh, which which is this very large shop but with a with a long uh, curved bill, and the common red shank. Now in the past we always assumed that a lot of these shorebirds come through the East Asian Australasian flyway. That is true, Eastern Asia, China, Korea, and all that. But what David found was uh, quite surprising because quite a lot of these uh, shorebirds that we're getting here on the peninsula, like the Wimbro and the Red Chang, actually come through the Central Asian flyway. We didn't think about that before, uh, but through the kinds of tracking information that he's able to collect using those transmitters that he has put on these birds, uh, we found that these birds were coming through the peninsula to Singapore, you know, via um, the coast of Myanmar. Uh, these birds have to fly over Tibet and the Himalayas to get over to the peninsula. So, so this basically tells us that the Malay Peninsula is not just connected to the East Asian Australasian flyway, as we saw earlier. It's also connected to the Central Asian flyway, a flyway that we don't know a lot about, but we are beginning to find out more and more about in, in, the, in the last couple of years. Um, and there are also emerging studies that are very, very interesting. I don't know how many of you may have seen this uh, piece of work that are done by our colleagues in Thailand. Uh, in Thailand, there's a really important site for observing migratory birds of prey in the peninsula part of Thailand called Khao Din Saw. And some of you perhaps might even have visited Khao Din Saw for, you know, uh, for watching all these huge groups of uh, migratory raptors flying through. But our colleagues, uh, Andrew Pierce, Phil Round, uh, Chukiat and others, they did a really exciting study not too long ago. What it did was to put transmitters, and this is uh, really one of the few studies of uh, you know migratory raptors here in Southeast Asia. They put transmitters on the Chinese sparrowhawk, a very familiar uh, raptor uh, to many of us here, uh, as well as the Japanese sparrowhawk, and they put, uh, they've been steadily tracking the movements of these birds. And uh, as of last year, as of last year, from uh, individuals of the Japanese sparrowhawk, a rather famous individual called Indy uh, that has been tracked from 
uh, Khao Din Saw, you can see the, the, the root of this sparrowhawk as it moves down the Malay Peninsula. So it goes through the eastern part of Thailand, of Peninsula Thailand, and after uh, several days of flight, it enters uh, Malaysian territory. You can see it moving through Kelantan and then into Pahang. And this bird, uh, obviously, um, we have tracked it even further down towards Indonesia. Um, and Phil has the data uh, for, for the migration route of this individual. This was found to eventually move through Johor and then into Singaporean territory. So this is probably one of the very few studies of migratory raptors here in the peninsula and telling us a great level of detail about the exact locations that the birds are passing through. So lots of uh, room for exciting discoveries here in, in, uh, in the peninsula. Um, and of course, there are also migratory birds that we don't know a lot about. Uh, bird watchers are helping us to find out more about these migratory birds. Uh, these are birds that are very seldom seen for reasons. Uh, perhaps uh, they are in places that people don't visit a lot or places that people don't visit at the right time. So one of these migratory birds that uh, we, we recently found out a lot about is called the rufous-headed robin. It's a really rare migratory bird that breeds only in a very small part of central China. And uh, once upon a time, uh, if you look at this picture here on the left side, uh, this is a very, very old photograph of the rufous-headed robin that was caught by you know, our colleagues working in, uh, in the Cameron Highlands. And that was more than 50 years ago. That was the first time ever the rufous-headed robin was seen outside of China. And uh, as of then, we started to realize that this is actually a long distance migratory bird that goes to Southeast Asia. But since this record of the 1960s, none has ever been seen again in, in, the, in the peninsula until more than 40, 50 years later, whereby one individual was spotted by a bird watcher who didn't even realize what he was looking at in Gunding Highlands. And in the last couple of years, uh, our colleagues, uh, Park Long and others, have gone up to Gunding Highlands and have seen uh, a regular individual of the rufous-headed robin there. The rufous-headed robin is an endangered species. It's a species that we don't know a lot about. And uh, uh, it's a species that obviously shows that bird watchers uh, themselves have a lot to uh, contribute to how we, uh, what we know about the ecology of a lot of these migratory songbirds. So lots of things that we don't know and lots of things for us to find out. Yet another bird that we are learning a lot about in recent years is uh, in the Malay Peninsula is the Aleutian tern. The Aleutian tern is not a particularly well-known uh, migratory water bird. Uh, the name tells us that these bird lives in the uh, islands and the coastal areas of far northeast Asia around the seas between uh, Alaska and, and Russia. Um, the Aleutian tern has been seen regularly, you know, uh, if you look at the map here, I've put here, you know, you can see all these little green splotches. These green splotches are indications of where they have been seen by bird watchers, you know, um, but a lot of the visits by bird watchers are very limited in time and space. So they don't tell us a lot about its migration. And in recent years, uh, colleagues in, in the United States of America have been uh, really upping their game to track the migration of this remarkable seabird. Um, and a lot of these Aleutian terns find their way from the Aleutian Islands in Alaska all the way to Southeast Asia. You can see on this map of the Malay Peninsula that a lot of these Aleutian terns that were studied by the uh, our American colleagues come to the coast of Peninsula Thailand, uh, to the coast of Peninsula Malaysia, and quite a bit to the coast of Singapore as well. So uh, a seabird that we don't know much about and we are beginning to learn a lot about in, in recent years because uh, more effort has been put in to, to study them. So um, yes, we still don't know a lot about migratory birds in this part of the world and uh, a lot remains to be learned about their ecology and their movements. Yeah, but, but, that said, but that said, we also are aware, you know, we are aware that a lot of our migratory birds are in trouble. A lot of them are in decline. Um, their numbers have plunged quite substantially in recent years. And in a recent uh, assessment of the Global Red Data Book, we find that uh, the East Asian Australasian Flyway, of which the Malay Peninsula is a part of, has the highest number of threatened species. I think I've mentioned this earlier on in my presentation. As of now, we have more than 61 species of our migratory birds here that are threatened with extinction which is far higher than any of the flyways in Africa, Europe, and North America. Um, so something really worrying and conservationists are trying to figure out why, how they are declining and what we can do about them. 
Um, the data sets are pretty consistent. Many kinds of shorebirds in Southeast Asia, many kinds of shorebirds that you are familiar with are in decline. Uh, this is a, a series of data that compiled by our colleagues in Australia. Uh, Australia, there are lots of shorebird researchers and they've been tracking the populations of many of these shorebirds, familiar shorebirds for many years. And when they put all these data sets together, they find that so many of our shorebirds have gone down in numbers in the last uh, 10, 20 years. Which is, which is really, really worrying. Uh, but shorebirds are not the only species that are affected. Uh, shorebirds are not the only species that are suffering huge declines. Another species that I've mentioned earlier on, the mass fin foot, is one of those what call that inland waterbirds that have suffered huge declines. And uh, this year, we tried to estimate its population and compare it to more than 10 years ago. Currently, we think there are less than 400 individuals left of the mass fin foot compared to more than a thousand individuals 10 years ago. So this particular waterbird has suffered quite a massive decline in recent years. This was taken from an article in the, in the Straits Times recently. So a really worrying bird that we should be watching out for. Uh, we should be trying to figure out more about its migration, where are the most important places for it, and how we can better protect these areas. But that's not all, right? We have seen shorebirds, we have seen uh, waterbirds like the mass fin food. A lot of our land birds, you know, land birds, passerine birds are also in decline. Um, land birds have not been st studied in great detail by a lot of scientists recently, until very recently, because there just simply isn't a lot of data for us to, to, to um, construct an understanding of how much they have declined. Um, and just last year, uh, a Korean colleague of mine started looking at the uh, patterns of decline of many of these land birds in Korea. I'm mentioning Korea because a lot of these migratory birds that breed in Korea uh, would pass through the Malay Peninsula. They might even winter in the Malay Peninsula. And many of these species that I will show on my next slide are species that are familiar to bird watchers in Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. Um, a lot of our migratory land birds, passerine birds, and raptors are in decline. Now, this uh, simple chart here basically shows that worst, uh, the birds that are declining uh, the worst of all these um, various migratory land birds in Korea. And you see that at the lower end of this chart, all right, there are a bunch of species that are very familiar to many bird watchers here. All right, you've got species like the black cap kingfisher, the brown shrike, the northern hokuku, ruddy kingfisher, yellow rum flycatcher. These are the, the worst decliners in Korea. Uh, and these are, this is the first, first few lines of evidence to show that our land birds are in deep trouble. Uh, similar kinds of studies have been done by our colleagues in Japan. Um, and we find that the outcome is not so different from what we are seeing in Korea. So, so declines are being seen in many groups of migratory birds um, around uh, the East Asian Australasian flyway. Why and how are they declining? Why are they declining? A lot of us are asking, you know, what's causing them to, you know, show such a big drop in their numbers? The, the, the biggest explanation is loss of habitat or the, the degradation of the habitat. A lot of migratory birds are suffering. Uh, a huge amount of habitat loss, you know, for, especially if you think about species that are living on the coastal areas. Look at the coast of Peninsula Malaysia and Thailand. This coast is under so much pressure from people, you know, people in Malaysia uh, expanding aquaculture along the coast of Penang, um, in the coast of Selangor, there are massive developments going on in the coast of Singapore. Many parts of the coast are now already reclaimed. So a lot of these Coastal wetlands, mud flats that were once very important to migratory birds have now been lost. Mud flats are not the only kinds of habitat that migratory birds use that uh, that are in the huge decline. Uh, don't forget that earlier on, I mentioned about forests. A lot of our migratory birds use forests, especially the land birds like you know the robins, the warblers, and the raptors. And tropical forest loss is uh, one of the best known environmental issues here in Southeast Asia. So putting all this together, we know that a lot of our uh, our migratory birds are in trouble because of habitat loss. Uh, as well as other threats like hunting um, and all that, yeah. And, and even with all this habitat loss uh, and other kinds of threats that migratory birds are facing, um, uh, we haven't really done that much to, to protect our migratory species. Um, in a recent study, we tried to understand how many of these important bird areas in Southeast Asia are protected. Uh, important bird areas are areas that are identified by partners of BirdLife International to be important for significant populations of birds. Uh, we have more than 600 coastal important bird areas here in Southeast Asia. Um, many of these are very, very, very important for migratory shorebirds from anything from the Spoonbill Sandpiper to the Notman's Green Shank, you know, but unfortunately many of our coastal IBAs are unprotected. They are not nature reserved. They are just free for all to grab. So, so this is a very worrying situation. 
because if these wetlands are lost in the future, it means that we'll lose all or pretty much most of the wintering habitat of some of these uh, fantastic shorebirds we have here in uh, the Malay Peninsula. How can we help them? How can we help migratory birds? Now I've gone through the kinds of migratory birds that we have here. Uh, I've talked a little bit about the threats and maybe we can talk a little bit more about threats during our Q&A. Uh, but some of you here might be interested to know what can we do, you know? It's good to know the problem. It's good to know that birds are declining and that we need to do something about it. But what exactly can be do? can be done. Um, and one of the ways to help our migratory birds is to make sure that our wetlands are better protected. We need to designate more areas of wetlands as protected areas or Ramsar sites. Uh, for those of you in Thailand and, and in Malaysia, you will know that uh, we have this fantastic international treaty called the Ramsar Convention. The Ramsar Convention is a, is a treaty that many, many countries around the world have signed up and it provides a framework for us to cooperate between countries to protect wetlands for migratory birds and other kinds of biodiversity while allowing people to use these wetlands sustainably. So the Ramsar Convention is a very powerful tool for us to work together. Malaysia and Thailand are both signatories to the Ramsar Convention and within the two countries, several areas of the most important wetlands are already designated as Ramsar wetlands, meaning that they'll get more attention from policymakers and conservationists uh, for long-term protection. Uh, on top of the Ramsar Convention, we also have the East Asian Australasian Flyway Network sites. Flyway Network sites are sites that are recognized by the East Asian Australasian Flyway partnership. So flyway network sites work in a very similar way to the Ramsar Convention. These are sites that are recognized for their importance to migratory birds. Uh, these are wetland sites recognized for the importance to, to, to significant congregations of migratory birds. And we are designating more and more of these important wetlands in this part of the world as flyway network sites. So both the Ramsar Convention and the flyway partnership, they are very important tools in our fight for migratory birds to protect wetlands, especially um, for some of the most threatened species of shorebirds, terns, and other kinds of waterbirds. Uh, for me here in BirdLife, we have a dedicated program of work. Uh, for BirdLife International, we work closely with NGO partners around Southeast Asia. And uh, for me, I work very closely with my colleagues in Singapore, in Malaysia, and Thailand. Uh, bird life partners that you're probably very familiar with, the uh, Bird Conservation Society of Thailand, the Malaysian Nature Society, and the Nature Society of Singapore. Um, and we work on migratory birds through a number of ways. We work to uh, advocate for some of these important sites for migratory species. We also work to advocate on, you know, some of the most important issues for migratory birds, like illegal hunting, habitat loss, and how uh, infrastructure developments are compromising some of the most important sites for migratory birds here in Southeast Asia. Uh, but most importantly, we work with local people. We work with local people to understand their needs and to also uh, get them to realize how important our ecosystems are for us so that they would have that buy-in for conservation activities into the future. So um, lots of exciting activities are happening, uh, you know, on the ground between many bird life partners to protect migratory species here in here in Southeast Asia. Uh, but that said, that said, you know, I mean, recognizing uh, the importance of conservation, there's also a need for us to do more research on our migratory birds. As I've mentioned several times in my presentation, uh, we still don't know a lot about migratory birds here on the peninsula. Many species are understudied, and the case of the rufous-headed robin, which I've mentioned, is a case whereby you've got a a species that's so threatened and we are only beginning to learn about where it goes to in winter here on the on the Malay Peninsula. In Thailand, there's a very exciting project by some of our colleagues there um, and this uh, island called Koh Man Nai. Koh Man Nai is on the Gulf of Thailand. Um, technically, it is not on the Malay Peninsula, but I want to mention this here because um, the island receives a lot of migratory birds from the Malay Peninsula. If you look at the map of uh, of Southeast Asia and see where Koh Manai exactly is. A lot of these migratory birds would move up the Malay Peninsula, cross the Gulf of Thailand and arrive in Koh Manai on their way further north to Korea, to China and to Japan. And this, this picture here by my colleague Kasset from the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand showcases that diversity of species that are being studied on Koh Manai. Uh, my colleagues are working there to track these birds as well as to put uh, uh, tags on them to better understand their migrations. So lots to be learned about migratory birds in, in, in Southeast Asia and even here in the, 
Malay Peninsula, especially uh, land bird species. Uh, and then at this point, some of you may be asking, is, you know, I, I'm not a scientist, uh, I'm not a professional conservationist, what can I do to, to, to help migratory birds? Uh, there are many things you can do, of course, you know, and first and foremost, you can work or support your local NGO. If you're in Singapore, you can work with the Nature Society of Singapore. They have lots of activities and programs for bird conservation in the Nature Society of Singapore, including stuff on migratory birds. If you are in Malaysia, you can work uh, closely with the Malaysian Nature Society. Uh, likewise, they have lots of exciting programs focused on monitoring um, and studying migratory birds in different parts of Malaysia. And of course, if you're in Thailand, you can join and support the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand. They have lots of cool programs focused on some of the most threatened migratory birds in, uh, in, in Asia. I encourage your friends to join these NGOs uh, and yourself as a bird watcher, collect that data and put them onto databases like eBird. Uh, a lot of this data that you put on online databases, they would prove to be very important sources of information in helping us understand the ecology and the migration of many of these of these species. For those of you who are bird watchers, you may be asking, where can I see migratory birds? You know, migratory birds are not the most conspicuous group of birds, and they only come through in a very narrow window of time. So if I'm a bird watcher, if I want to pay more attention to migratory birds, where can I go? Here's a, a quick snapshot of some of these most important sites. I, I've classified the sites into two color schemes. You've got the sites that are in green. The sites that are in green are really good for you to spot migratory raptors like Japanese sparrowhawks, uh, Chinese goshawks and, and honey buzzards. Uh, one of the most important sites uh, in this region is this uh, little hill on the Thai province of Chumpon called Khao Din So. For those of you who have gone, gone to Khao Din So, you'll be truly, truly uh, overwhelmed by the huge amounts of migratory raptors that pass through this, this little coastal hill every year. Uh, further south in Malaysia, for those of you all in Malaysia, you can visit uh, the little cape of Tanjung Tuan. In Tanjung Tuan is a really important site for us in observing migratory birds as they move back from Sumatra back to the Malay Peninsula each uh, spring. Um, and every year we count, you know, in excess of tens of thousands of these migratory honey buzzards and goshawks, sparrowhawks and all that as they move up the peninsula from Tanjung Tuan. If you are in Singapore, if you're in Singapore, where would you see raptors? Uh, if you're in Singapore, go to places on the southern ridges, places like Kenridge Park, Mount Faber. These are excellent viewing points, vantage points for you to see migratory birds as they move into uh, the Riau Islands. Um, they may not be numbers as big as what you will see in Khao Din So and Tanjung Tuan, but you can still see quite a good variety of species uh, if you uh, are there at the right time of the day. For those of you who want to look at migratory water birds, shore birds, terns and all that, there are a bunch of good sites that you could visit. Uh, I'm now going to move from south to north. Uh, if you're in Singapore, you will go to places like Ubin or Sungai Bulo. You can see good congregations of plovers, sandpipers and all that in Ubin especially. Uh, in Sungai Bulo, you will see things like wimbrels, red shanks, marsh sandpipers and all that. But if you're living in Kuala Lumpur and if you're lucky enough to visit the Kapar power station, you will see so many of these uh, shorebirds. Good numbers of Caspian Tern, Notman Screenshank at the right time, Great Knot and all that. And then, of course, you've got the Penang Coast, which is one of the most important uh, concentrations of shorebirds in the peninsula. Uh, what if you are in Thailand? Of course, Thailand, um, one of the best part, parts of Thailand in the Thai Peninsula for us to see. Migrate. There are quite a lot of sites on the Thai Peninsula for shorebirds, but one of the more accessible sites is in Krabi. If you're in Krabi, there's a sand spit called Lem Pakarang, where, you know, at the right time of the year, you could see good congregations of plovers, sandpipers. And once upon a time, uh, Krabi would be a good place for people to see uh, wintering crab plover, which unfortunately are now uh, pretty much extinct in the peninsula. So still lots of good place for you to see migratory birds in, in, the, in the peninsula. For those of you who want to learn about migratory birds through games, recently I worked with some colleagues who developed a really cool uh, board game for migratory birds and features featuring familiar birds of Asia. You can see here the Black Bazaar, the uh, short yet Owl, the Fairy Pita, and all that. Um, the game was uh, conceived to you know, get people to understand more about the threats that migratory birds face as they move down the East Asian Australasian flyway. And uh, players will compete with each other to try to save as many species as they can. Yeah, but anyway, I shouldn't go too much into, into the game because I know that our time is running short. And if you are interested to learn more about our, our migratory bird game, you can 
you know, do a quick scan of this QR code. It'll bring you to the website that explains to you how the game is played, what the species are featured, um, and what kinds of threats they face. So um, with that, uh, that brings me to the end of today's presentation. Um, I'm mindful that we don't have that much time left, but we probably still have a couple of minutes for a few quick questions on migratory birds. So once again, thanks to, uh, thanks to Gloria for making time on the Saturday morning to host me to talk about migratory birds. Um, open to the floor for questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ding Li, for the very interesting talk. Okay, we have some questions here. Um, okay, the first question is Do all migratory birds migrate in groups? Um, or many, flocks? <laughs> many, many migratory birds migrate in flocks. Yeah. Um, sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't see it. Um, for, for water birds, we can see it easily because a lot of water birds migrate in the day. So you can see groups of water, water birds moving through the coastline, you know, but a lot of uh, songbirds, passerine birds, you know, they're tiny little birds. They migrate at night in flocks. And we know that it's going on because um, in the last, last 20, 30 years, people have been using radar to track these birds and you can see little bleeps, bleeps on the radar. Now, a single songbird will not give you a bleep on the, on the radar because they're really tiny, you know, but a flock of them moving through at night, that will give you a bleep on the radar. So we know that many migratory birds will move in groups for various reasons, uh, but particularly for safety reasons, yeah. Okay, so how has uh, climate change affected the migratory patterns in the last five years? how have climate changed? I think um, we know a lot about how climate change has mig affected migratory birds in other parts of the world. I think this is a really well studied phenomena in Europe and in North America. There's a huge number of studies that show that migratory birds are arriving later, earlier, uh, and at times that are not ideal for them because they will arrive in the places where they breed when their food resupplies are not in the highest number. So um, that probably affects migratory bird survival, you know. But in Asia, we don't know a lot about um, how climate change is affecting them. A study that I, did were, I was lucky to work on more than 10 years ago was basically to understand, you know, the arrival times of migratory birds in Singapore and trying to relate that to, to climate change. And we find that quite a bunch of species that we get in Singapore are, you know, arriving later and later by significant amounts, you know. So from two to five days late, on average. Um, and we hypothesize that this could be due to climate change uh, impacts on them. You know. by, but by and large, I must say that we still don't know a lot about how climate change are affecting the migratory, migratory timings of birds in Asia. We can probably extrapolate from what we know in Europe and in North America, but we are still looking for the uh, evidence um, in this part of the world. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um... A lot of migratory species are on the decline, but are there those that are actually going against the trend and at increasing in number? So in that case, uh, this person is asking, does it like suggest that there's natural selection uh, in favor of this of uh, some bird species? Um, we can know the trend of a uh, bird's population if we have information collected over many years. All right. Um, the challenge for us here in Asia is that there are not so many birds in many countries that have information collected over many years. Okay. Um, the countries countries in Asia like Korea, Japan, they do have this kind of information that they've collected since the 70s, since the 60s. But uh, one of the best example of a migratory bird in Asia uh, that has shown substantial increase um, and even more interesting for us, because this species is an endangered species here in Asia, is the black-faced spoonbill. The black-faced spoonbill has increased its population from 1,000 more than 10 years ago to currently more than 5,000 individuals. So it's increased quite a bit. Uh, and we attribute the increase to better conservation. Uh, we are doing better in, in Taiwan. We are doing better in Hong Kong. We're doing better in Korea. Some of the most important breeding sites are already protected. So we think that is the reason why uh, the black face spoonbill has increased. Uh, it's a, it's an indication that if we take action, species can recover. Yeah, but uh, by and large, we still don't know much about the population trends of many species, uh, and 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 especially here in Southeast Asia, where there is really not much data on many species. Yeah, but in Singapore, I just wanted to make a note because you know many of the observers on this on this call are probably from Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, um, the group of migratory birds that have suffered the biggest decline are the shorebirds. We know that from observation, we know that from data. Um, 
um, recently we looked at the data collected by the Nature Society of Singapore um, for many of these shorebirds. And uh, you can see that uh, many of the commonest shorebirds have shown huge declines. Uh, the best example being things like the marsh sandpiper. Um, if, you, if you went looking for a marsh sandpiper in Sungai Bolo 20 years ago, you will see huge flocks of them. If you go there now, you will see one or two. Um, and these numbers are consistent. We've done mathematical models on them. We know that the numbers are something that we can trust and believe. So um, the decline is real for many species. So what, why has the black base uh, spoonbill gone against this trend? Um, the reason why, okay, the reason why we think it's gone better for the black face spoonbill is because we have done a lot to, to protect it. Uh, the most important sites that the black face spoonbill visit in winter in Hong Kong, Vietnam, and Taiwan are all currently nature reserves. Mm -hmm. They are protected. In the nature reserve, you cannot hunt them. Uh, people try to improve the habitat for them. And uh, most of the places the Blackface Bumbu breed in on the Korean Peninsula uh, are very remote or already declared as nature reserves. So um, in the last 20, 30 years. So you add all these things together, um, this bird has a better chance than many other species because a lot of action has been taken on the ground across the region. The catch for migratory birds is that, is that if you want to protect them, you have got to protect them across the region. You can't just protect them in Singapore and don't do anything in other countries or vice versa. So um, the black face view is a demonstration that if we work together uh, between different parties in different countries, we can actually help migratory birds. Okay, that's heartening to hear. Okay, so is there a MOTUS uh, wildlife tracking system in place to track migratory birds in Asia? Uh, that's a very good question. I think that question is probably best directed to my colleagues in Birds Canada because Birds Canada developed MOTUS um, or facilitate the operation of MOTUS. Um, I, as far as I can understand, discussions have been in place to develop MOTUS for Asia, uh, but this has not really happened yet. Yeah. But other researchers are working using their own, uh, you know, um, facilities and and resources to track migratory birds without motors. Most researchers working on shorebirds in Asia, um, they would be using satellite transmitters. Uh, there are also quite a number of researchers, many of my close friends, working on migratory bird tracking. They use light level geolocators. So light level geolocators are one of the smallest gadgets we have. Uh, they can weigh less than half gram, half a gram, uh, and they are used to track the migration of uh, some of the smallest passerine birds. The, check, the catch for these birds is that you need to recover them, and it's very hard to recover a bird. A lot of them go missing. Yeah, but if you can recover them, you can get back a lot of data, and you can plot the migratory routes uh, on a map, and you can then understand where exactly these birds went through. Okay, that's uh, good. But the thing is that, um, is there a way, instead of having to recover the birds, uh, are there like light geolocators that, uh, that allow you to track them without having to recover them? Not yet. Not yet. Give, give a few more years. Yeah, not yet. The technology is not quite there yet. Yeah. Okay. Are drones being used to track migratory birds? Which one? Those are drones. Um, drones, uh, yes and no. Drones are mostly used to observe migratory birds from afar. Okay. Yeah, but a lot of conservationists, they don't recommend using drones because drones will flush the migratory birds Yeah, when they're hovering too near to the migratory birds. So we don't try to use that a lot for monitoring birds. Uh, drones are used for other conservation purposes, mm -hmm. from monitoring forests to monitoring orang utans and whatever. Um, but migratory birds, it's still uh, not recommended. Okay. They, they, would they like also collide with uh, migratory birds, these drones? Um, I am not sure, but I know there's quite a few incidents where, whereby uh, an eagle took down a drone. So oh, yeah. <laughs> that's good. <isn't> that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's a question that um, uh, with regards to Singapore, that the government in Singapore is uh, dedicating a new nature park in Katip Bongsu. Mm. And uh, will this help in the conservation of migratory shorebirds? I think it would. Um, I don't know how many shorebirds are in Katip Bongsu these days. My last visit to Katip Bongsu was about 27 years ago. Okay. Yeah, and, and back in the days, there were I remember there were good numbers of shorebirds uh, like uh, Wimbro and Red Chengs and all that. Um, but because Katip Bongsu is uh, much, much of it is restricted access, uh, I think we don't get into this area of mangrove and mudflats to count birds as much. So we don't know as much about Katip Bongsu as we would know about Sungai Bolo and uh, Pulau Ubin and other areas of mudflats in Singapore. Okay, 
So in terms of other beaches in Singapore, such as West Coast Park, Sembawang Park, Changi Beach, East Coast, are these uh, areas of interest, I mean, uh, of concern for my Beatrice Roberts? Um, not so much. Um, in the old days, like 20, 30 years ago, Ch the Changi coastline was particularly important for migratory plovers and other small shorebirds, yeah. But much of that has been lost. Um, I just wanted to re recall that in 1999, we found the first and the only spoon-billed sandpiper, the most threatened migratory bird in Asia, in Changi, um, which is now currently Terminal 4 of the Changi Airport. So all that habitat has been largely lost. There might be little pockets of woodland here and there left, you know, but I think that the, the coastline of Changi is radically altered from what it was 100 years ago, what it was 20 years ago, yeah. Okay. So, um, okay, another question is about uh, does rubbish affect migratory birds and how does it affect? Um, I think rubbish is a big deal because uh, especially for rubbish that is uh, constituted of plastic, they will break down very slowly and they will linger in the in the marine ecosystem for a long, long time. So migratory birds would ingest uh, plastic debris um, as they feed on, you know, other things in the mud or in water. Uh, we still don't know a lot about how uh, rubbish affect migratory birds. We've seen pictures, of course, you know, pictures of birds, you know, caught around plastic or uh, you know, face masks and all that, you know, but I don't think there's a huge amount of uh, study, you know, or, or uh, proper study showing how they have affected my birds. But I, I hate to imagine um, that, you know, in 10 years time when we have a better understanding, it will not look good at all. Yeah. Okay. So about the migratory owls, what are those that are found in our region? Uh, in the Malay Peninsula, we have four or five types of migratory owls. Um, we have the Oriental Scops owl, which is uh, uh, not, a, not a particularly familiar owl that breeds in Eastern China, Korea, Southeast Russia, and Japan. They come to Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. We've got the Northern Bubuk. It's a, a larger owl. Uh, if you were in Japan, Northern Bubuks are some of the commonest owls around, you know, and we know that they come to the Malay Peninsula as well. Um, and then less often seen, we've got the uh, short year owl. The short year owl is an owl of grassland. Uh, maybe, Gora, you've seen it before, right? Short Yard Owl. Yeah, yeah, I have. Long ago in Changi Cove. Yeah, long ago we had that, these Short Yard Owls in Changi. Um, they are migratory birds from Eastern Asia, but I don't think um, we've seen one for a, for a couple of years now. I think one was recovered from Changi Coast uh, two years ago. Uh, collision, but, uh, but uh, last year, I don't think we had any Short Yard Owls. Yeah. So we've got three, I think we've got at least three owls in this region, which are long distance migrants. Okay. So, uh, so, what is the most endangered raptor uh, coming through our, our part of the world? Uh, yeah. The Eastern Imperial Eagle would be the most threatened raptor in the Malay Peninsula. Eastern Imperial Eagle, um, in, in they come through in good numbers, but very, very, very few individuals trickle down to Singapore. Eastern Imperial Eagle, uh, they are quite quite regular in parts of Malaysia. So for those uh, bird watchers on the call who have visited, uh, you know, the coastal areas of Penang, the rice fields of Penang, Malacca, um, and Perlis in the northernmost tip of Peninsula Malaysia, you might see the Eastern Imperial Eagle. Uh, there are also paddy fields in Peninsula Thailand where they occur in good numbers. Yeah, this is a globally threatened species. But in Singapore, we hardly get any Eastern Imperial Eagles. Uh, we've got one that went to Pulau Bin four years ago. And um, that was the first one in the many, many, many years. So they're very rare. The further south you go, the rarer they are. They are there's only one record of this bird from Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think uh, we are running out of time. So I just uh, asked the last question. Can, can. Uh, do good. migratory birds stay back for a season or longer? That means they overstay. I, I quite a lot of the migratory shorebirds overstay. I believe some of the migratory landbirds overstay as well because I've I've seen incidences where people observe a uh, you know uh, a particular wobbler very very late in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, but shorebirds are the group of migratory birds that we we see most regularly in mid year. So for example, if people went to places like Sungai Buloh right now, or wetlands uh, in Malaysia on the Selangor coast or in Padang, you will still see a few wet uh sorry a few wetlands a few shorebirds lingering around. Uh, these are usually the young birds that don't want to go back home for for a spring. Uh, yeah, but they would they would go back the in subsequent seasons. Yeah, so for many of these migratory shorebirds, you will still see tiny numbers around this region. 
uh, even in spring. In spring, they should be back in, uh, in, in, in Siberia or in northern China or in Tibet for breeding. Yeah, but small numbers would overstay in this part of the uh, in this part of the world. Yeah, okay. so yeah, that's the uh, that's the. Uh, I hope that answers the question properly. How about the little egret? Because I understand that some some populations have con continued to linger on even throughout the entire year. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, little little egrets are a complicated species, you no? Know, because little egret is a very very wide ranging, but they are migratory populations. There are also populations in this part of the world. So we need to be clear about whether if these individuals came from the migratory population or from the regional populations. We know that little egret breeds in Malaysia, in the peninsula of Malaysia. There are heronries today where little egret breed in. In Indonesia, on the Sumatra coast, which is not so far from Singapore, there are huge, huge colonies of egrets breeding there. Okay. So again, not difficult for those. How about little... Singapore itself? Do they breed here? The little egret? Um, we have no evidence that the little egret breeds in Singapore. Okay. Currently, I will. I, um, maybe one day we'll find a colony of them. I, we don't have so many breeding colonies of egrets and herons in Singapore. I think there was a big one in Khatib Bongsu uh, 20 years ago. There was a big one for purple herons in Sungai Bulo, and there's another medium sized one for purple heron in, in the Mandai Zoo. Um, but these are the only ones that we know about. Yeah. And of course, one in Pulau Ubin. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Thanks, Ding Lee, for the very interesting talk and all the questions answered. And thanks, everybody, for attending. So I don't want to keep you all around. So uh, for the next webinar, please sign up. Uh, we will think of, uh, we will invite an interesting speaker. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.